Well, Chris Quinn, our youth pastor, texted me in the afternoon yesterday. He said, well, Lindsay and I are at the hospital. She's uh, having big contractions, but I'm not, she's not dilated. So it may be a while. And I, I couldn't have been more than 45 minutes later. He texts me again and says, Avery's here. <laughs> so I tell you, that was a pretty quick deal. So, uh, teenagers, we don't have uh, youth right now. You guys are going to stay in here, and there's nothing tonight as well. So Chris will be at the hospital. Uh, Tom Rayner tells us that uh, nine out of ten churches in the United States are flat or declining. And, uh, or they're not keeping up with the population growth of their community. In other words, we're losing ground in our, old ma- our own backyards. He also tells us that uh, two-thirds of builders, people uh, born between 1925 and 1946, are Christians in the United States. But only 15% of millennials born between 1980 and 2000 are Christians. And they're the largest uh, uh, group in our country, 80 million. Uh, he says, we've nearly lost that generation. Wall Street Journal reports that on an average Sunday, 17.5% of Americans are, come to church. And Portland being the least church city in America, we, our statistics are even less. So clearly, we are having some problems in getting the news of Jesus Christ out to our fellow Americans. Uh, Sometimes it's that we just don't care about finding people and bringing them into the church. Other times it might be that we're judgmental. And we actually think some some people don't deserve to be in church. We think there are some people God has no use for. Uh, If I were to take a straw poll of uh, who God has use for, my guess is there would probably be general agreement in the room. I've, if, if I said, uh, give me a show of hands, how many think uh, God loves uh, Pope Francis or Billy Graham or Rick Warren or Joel Osteen? I, I, my guess is people say, yeah, yeah, they're, they're, good, they're good men. Uh, but if I said, how about, uh, you know, uh, Kim Jong-un, the dictator of uh, North Korea or uh, Ali Khamenei? the supreme religious leader in Iran, or Abdelhamid Aboud, the suspected ringleader of the Paris uh, terrorist attacks. My guess is many people say, I, I, I'm not so sure God has much use for those people. We all carry around unpublished lists of people we think God po- can't possibly care about. Child pornographers, drug peddlers, terrorists, serial killers, rapists, Although we may not verbalize it, we think God doesn't have much use for those people, and neither do I. It's really easy for us to sit back and make armchair assessments as to who does and doesn't matter. One day, Jesus was teaching in a large metropolitan area, and he was talking to some irreligious folks. uh, The unconvinced, the uh, morally bankrupt, uh, spiritually confused. And beside him also was a group of religious people uh, who were complaining that Jesus was associating with these undesirables. How dare Jesus reach out to sinners like that, they were muttering to each other. Well, Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he moved the irreligious group over with the religious people and told a story. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? I assume he has a fellow shepherd who takes care of the 99. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. A shepherd loses a sheep. He leaves the 99 and he goes to search for it. He searches for some time. Finally, he finds it on the ed- edge of a ravine, caught in a briar bush. He disentangles it and takes it home. And when he gets home, he asks the other shepherds to rejoice with him. 
that he found his sheep. Jesus paused. People were still listening. So he told him another story. Suppose a woman has ten silver coins, loses one. Does she, doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her husband and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. A woman loses a coin. She lights a lamp and sweeps the whole house until she finds it. And then she calls her friends and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost coin. Jesus looked around. People were still listening. So I told them about another story about a man who had two sons. Here comes the famous story of the prodigal son. Now, if ever the phrase was true, familiarity breeds contempt, this is it. You say, I've heard this story. I've read the story of the prodigal son. I've even studied it. I beg you today to look at it with fresh eyes. Like this is the first time you've ever read it. The younger brother got stars in his eyes and wanted to experience some fast lane living. So he asked for his inheritance early. It's kind of like your son coming to you and saying, Dad, you're going to kick off someday. You're probably going to leave me something. Why don't you give it to me now? I mean, it's an unbelievable request. But even more unbelievable was that the father, knowing full well what his son was going to do, granted his request. Sure enough, after turning the property into cash, the young man packed his bags and took off for some fast living. He had lots of fun and friends for a while. But once he squandered his inheritance, he found out that fast lane friends don't hang around when the money runs out. Jesus tells us the boy took a menial job as a minimum wage, mystheos, the Greek word used for the lowest level of servant. So he took a job as a mystheos, feeding pigs that his Hebrew religion abhorred. He got so hungry, he longed to eat the carob pods that the pigs refused. In the younger son's rebellion, we see a lot of ourselves. All of us have things we've done we're not proud of. Then the son came to his senses. He said, my father's servants are doing better than I am. I'll go back, ask forgiveness, and I'll hire on as one of his workers. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and the sandals on his feet. What's he saying? The best robe in the house would be the father's robe. The father is saying, I'm not going to wait until you've paid off all your debts. I'm not going to wait until you've duly groveled. You're not going to earn your way back into the family. I'm just going to accept you back. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. As he came up the road to his father's house, his father came running down to meet him. He didn't wait on the porch of his home. Tapping his foot, saying, here comes that kid. After all he's done, he better have a good apology. No, he went running to him. It was considered undignified for an older man to run. But this father couldn't run fast enough. His legs wouldn't move quickly enough to express his heart of forgiveness and grace for his son. The son said, Father, I don't deserve to be your son. Father interrupted him, shh, don't talk like that. Jesus shows us the father pouncing on the son with love and forgiveness before he has a chance to clean up his life and evidence that he's had a heart change, before he's even able to get out his a repentance speech, which he's practiced. The father's love and acceptance are absolutely free. 
Jesus told three parables, rapid fire, one after another. Why? I believe Jesus was so incensed with the religious people's bigotry and exclusiveness that he said, let's clear this matter up once and for all. All three stories have a common thread. In each case, something of value is missing. The shepherd lost his sheep. The woman lost her coin and the father lost his son. When Jesus finished the three stories, I think a light went off in the people's minds, especially the religious people. They say, here we are condemning Jesus for reaching out to these people we consider undesirable. Here we are looking down our noses at these people we think God has no use for. Yet it's pretty obvious that Jesus is telling us that God loves these people. He loves everyone. When I think when the listeners put these stories together, they were blown away by how much God loves us. God cares about people who are off the track, people who are down and out. Here's Jesus' whole point. God loves you. Once we get the big idea, I think there are at least two important things Jesus wants us to learn from these parables. First, God makes an all-out search for his children and rejoices when they are found. The shepherd searched for the sheep. The woman searched for the coin. And the father searched for his son. Notice that the father ran to his son. Whatever else you believe about God, know this. God runs to us. Right now he's running to you and me. To embrace us in his love and grace. Jesus says, you want to know what God is like? Look at the father in this parable. You do not find grace like this in any other religion in the world. Buddhists have a story like the story of the prodigal son, but it ends very differently. Son comes back and he has to work off his misdeeds for 25 years, uh, shoveling dung. Now, I'll bet if we took 100 people in the United States and I asked them, how do you get made right with God? I bet 99 would say, I have to do something. This story of the prodigal son only comes from the lips of Jesus. Christian faith is the only faith that's of grace and forgiveness and love. I mean, you wouldn't find this story coming out of Islamic circles. There's a high level of shame if a son went off and, you know, did this kind of living. If he came back, believe me, he'd be on his hands and knees in front of Allah. And he'd have to do some serious penance if they let him live at all. But Jesus tells us that God loves you. He's gracious. He's waiting for you to welcome you back. You don't find that kind of grace and reconciliation with God in Islam. In Islam, to be accepted into God, you have to keep the five pillars. Uh, recite that there's no other God but Allah. Uh, pray five times a day. Give 2.5% of your assets to the mosque or Islamic charity. Uh, keep the fast of Ramadan and make the pilgrimage to Mecca. If you do those five things, you're going to make it into heaven? You're not for sure. Because when you meet Allah, they're going to weigh your good deeds and your bad deeds. And if your good deeds exceed your bad deeds, even then you're not sure you're going to get into heaven because Allah decides. He may not honor the scales. So the only way you can make sure you're going to get into heaven is if you die when you're in the midst of a pilgrimage to Mecca or in battle for Allah. A jihad will do it. That's why there are so many recruits willing to make the ultimate sacrifice in the cause of jihad. That explains why the 9-11 terrorists were found at strip clubs and uh, drinking at bars the, the final nights before the terrorist attack. 
because they were confident that their act of jihad would decisively tip the scale in their favor. So what you have with Islam is a system of trying to please Allah. But you never know for sure if uh, you've done enough to warrant heaven. If you're not in the habit of attending church, this text says you matter immensely to God. You may identify with the prodigal son and feel like you don't matter to God. You may feel like you don't matter to a lot of people, your parents, your teachers, employers, or anybody, but it's not true. You matter to God. Our God is filled with compassion, no matter who's dug, what kind of hole in their life. He loves you. Everybody is a somebody to God. He created us all and he loves us all. If you let yourself be found by God, there will be rejoicing in heaven. You give your heart to Christ and all heaven will erupt in joyous celebration. I mean, we rejoice when we find our lost children. Having a, a large family with nine children, it's easy to lose one of your kids. You know, at the mall, a large gathering. You know, one of, the, you know, one of the easiest places you can lose your kid is at church. I mean, one Sunday we crawled in our van and I made the mistake of not counting off. The noise level was about right, and so we headed home. Nobody said anything. And then we got home. <clears throat> We're making brunch, and all of a sudden somebody says, Where's baby Drea? And so I rushed back to church and went into the nursery and oh, I said, I'm sorry, I'm so late. You know, a lot of people want to talk to the pastor. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't do that. Um, so I rushed uh, Drea home and we loved on her. Everybody was so excited. Oh, Drea, sorry. If we get excited and we're happy when we find a lost child, God rejoices when he finds one of us. God loves you. The second important thing I think God would want us to take from these parables is that God wants us to love people in the same way he does. Jesus shared this parable not simply so we would understand God's love. He was addressing the religious leaders who objected that he ate with social outcasts, prostitutes, and tax collectors. There was no room in their theology for accepting unreligious people into God's kingdom. Jesus says, shame on you. Why can't you welcome people into the kingdom, into the church, the same way my father does? This is what we call a double-edged parable. A double-edged parable, there are two stories. The first story is the story of the younger son who asked his dad for his inheritance, went off some, some fast living, uh, ran out of money, came to his senses, came back, asked his dad for forgiveness, and his father welcomed him with love. The second half of the story is about the older brother. He was unhappy that the father accepted the older brother like, back like that. And in a double-edged parable, the emphasis is always on the second part of the parable. Usually when you hear, hear this story, the emphasis is on the prodigal son. But the real emphasis here is on the older brother. Uh, Jesus is telling us that there are two brothers in this story. Jesus is saying there are two ways to be alienated from God. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. That's where we expect to find him, in the field. He's the picture of responsibility. There was work to be done. All the time the younger son was off squandering the family money, the older son was keeping the farm. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked, what's going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back, safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. He was angry about all this fanfare over a worthless brother. Anybody with children understands the tendency for sibling rivalry. Uh, when our second son was born, David, we soon realized that Tad, our oldest son, kind of 
resented this new brother that was taking attention that he used to get all to himself. So we'd find him dropping toys on David in his bassinet. Boom. You know, putting his blanket over his head or his pillow over his head. He wanted to get him out of the picture. So we can understand uh, sibling rivalry, uh, but to refuse to greet his brother and celebrate his return is taking things too far. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. He says, you've never given me even a goat for a party. How dare you give him the calf? He's adding things up. I've worked myself to death and earned everything I got. But my brother has done nothing to earn anything, and yet you throw him a party. Where's the justice in that? The other brother talks all about, the older brother talks about all that he's done. I've never disobeyed you, so I have rights. He's saying, I deserve to be consulted about this. You have no right to make decisions without me. My son, the father said, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Jesus points this parable at religious people, older brother types, who begrudged him extending God's kingdom to sinful people whom they would not think, with whom they would not think to associate. I've seen Christ followers get so cut off from non-believers, they feel no responsibility to, to build a relationship with them and invite them to church. And they actually get annoyed with people outside the kingdom. Jesus asks us the same question today. Why can't you forgive people and welcome them into your church the same way my father does? Can you imagine what might have happened if the prodigal, the younger son, met the his older brother on the way home, he would have never made it home. It's a sad thing that in many churches, the prodigal son comes home, comes into the church. The only one there is the older son. How many people never make it back to the father's love because of older brothers in the church? If being with the father means having to contend with the indignant attitudes of condemning older brothers in the church, many people would say, I'll just stay away. Sadly, rather than being places of love and welcome, churches can become centers of judgment. How easy it is to make rash judgments like the religious folks to whom Jesus directed these parables, that God doesn't really care about certain types of people. We think they don't matter much to God. But the truth is they do. This text tells us you've never looked into the eyes of another human being that God does not love dearly. Jesus shows us in this parable that there are two ways to be alienated from God. The younger son wanted his father's money but didn't want the father. The older brother didn't love the father either. He was upset how the father was using the assets of the estate. He too wanted the money but not the father. The younger son was alienated from the father by being very, very bad. The older son was alienated from the father by being very, very good. Jesus wants us to see that the older brother was also alienated from the father. He was angry and wouldn't go into the party. He felt he had the right to tell the father how the robes, rings, and livestock of the family should be deployed. In the same way, if we live good lives... We think as a result that God owes us. The first sign that you have an elder brother spirit is that when your life doesn't go as you want, you aren't just sorrowful. You are angry and bitter. You believe that if you live a good life, you should get a good life. And that God owes you a smooth road if you try hard to live up to his standards. 
If this is your thinking, you'll be furious with God when things don't go the way you think they should. You don't deserve this, you think. After how hard you've worked to be a decent person. If you're a regular churchgoer, these parables tell you that you are to love people like God does. In these parables and all through his life, Jesus displays a prodigious obsession with people. As God's child, you and I are to be the visible expression of God's non-judgmental forgiveness and acceptance to hurting people. If you're not in the habit of attending church, this text tells you that God loves you immensely. You may feel God can't possibly care about you, but it's not true. No matter what you've done, God loves you. I believe the look I believe that the two sons are a look in the mirror for all of us. All of us here are like the younger son, the prodigal son in some ways. All of us would be embarrassed to death if things were flashed on the screen that we've done that we're embarrassed of. All of us also have some of the older brother in us. We can be quite judgmental, can't we? Who are we to stand in the way of God reaching out to his children? What gives us the right to not forgive people that God has forgiven? God says, I do not slight you when I forgive people and bring them into the church. Everything that is mine is yours to enjoy. You should rejoice when people are found. Jesus leads us to the abiding principle. We are to forgive people the same way God graciously forgives people. Jesus calls us to be like our Father in heaven. There are people all around us who need forgiveness. Many of them will not set foot in the church because they feel guilty and feel they'll be judged. We must share with them that God forgives them and that we welcome them with open arms as well. Isn't it the whole point in life to take as many of our family members, our friends, our neighbors, our classmates, our coworkers with us to heaven? Isn't that what life's all about? So how can we find people who may be far from God and bring them into the church? Let me suggest six quick things. One, identify people. Who are the people in your life who probably do not know Christ? And you may be the only church-going Christian they know. And God may want to use you to reach them. Two, pray. Pray for them. The whole deal is to be led by the Holy Spirit. The highest value in this whole thing is, is to stay attuned to the Holy Spirit's promptings. You say to God at the beginning of every day, God, I'm available to you. I'm available to love people, stop and talk to people. Where, where do you have somebody? You want me to hear their story or tell my story? And then you watch God open doors. Three, develop relationships with people. Surveys show that the longer you attend church, the less non-believers you have relationships with. That makes sense. You come to church and you start going to Bible studies and community groups and, you know, you, you spend more time with Christians. So we have to step out of our comfort zone and take steps to build friendships with people who may be far from God. And we have to make sure we don't judge them. Four, discover people's stories. In the process of building a relationship with them, ask them to tell you their story. What's your story about with God and faith? You want to hear their story before you tell them your story. Five, look for opportunities to share what Jesus has done for you. It's very important that when you share, it's very personal. What has Jesus done for you? How has he helped in your life or changed your life? Don't just share with them steps they can take to become a Christian. Then finally, invite them. Invite them to give their life to Jesus. Invite them to come to church with you or to come to some other event at church with you. Our board this year thought that was a reasonable goal for this entire church. Every one of us bring one person this year. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for teaching this parable and being our teacher today. We see so clearly 
that you and God the Father love people immensely, everybody, and you want us to love people the same way, everybody. And so we want to commit ourselves to doing that. I want to give you all an opportunity just to respond to Jesus and what you've heard today. For some of you, maybe you feel like the prodigal son, like you need a whole lot of forgiveness. You could ask for that forgiveness right now. Say, Jesus, I want you to come into my life and be my Lord. I want to follow you the rest of my days. If that sounds like you, just whisper something like that to him right now. Others of you, maybe the thing that hits you is that you're like the older brother, the religious people, maybe judgmental, and you say, boy, I want to tamp that down, and I want to be open-minded to all people, and uh, I want to be thinking about who I can reach out to and share Christ with and share my story with. Maybe you make that commitment. I'll give you about a minute just to pray silently. Lord God, help us to have hearts like you have, hearts of mercy, forgiveness, and love. And may we be looking for many, the many people in Portland who probably do not know you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>